So far infrared and submillimeter astronomy. And uh, where everything in the universe is born. Actually, as you'll see in a few moments, when things are created, when galaxies, stars, and planets are created, it turns out that they primarily emit at these kind of wavelengths. And as you'll see, there's a few things you can do from the ground, but for the most part, if you want to do studies of this kind of stuff, all the processes of formation of anything in the universe, you have to work from space. So I'm going to uh, uh, tell you a little bit about the science. A little bit about the science, not very much about the science. I want to talk more about the technology. And uh, just to sort of, to justify why we, we want to even do this technology, I'll just tell you a little, a few things about the science parts. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about what you can do from the ground, and we have a, an instrument that we built. Uh, actually, some of the work was done here at Waterloo, and I'm the head of the Canadian half of the project. And that is just, just going into, into operation in, in Hawaii on top of a very high mountain. I'll show you that just briefly, but I got fun pictures of that. Uh, but then uh, uh, we have to go into space. So I'll tell you what's been done in the past. One quick slide, uh, just summarizing all the things that have ever been done before. And then I'll start showing you the stuff that we're doing now, including the rocket we just launched last year, uh, the satellite, the part of it that we built here in Waterloo, uh, and, uh, and then something about future missions. And uh, well, even in history, I'll actually show you a movie of our last one. And it's a nice story there. And uh, near-term funded missions, funding and, un and getting money is, is a huge, huge part of this. And I just spent the last week writing documents out, another two weeks worth of work, the next set of documents for funding for our future missions. So why do this? Why far infrared? Why submillimeter? Most of the light produced and most of the energetic processes in the universe, like the stars, is that visible light. It's visible wavelengths that your eye can see. But between us down here on the Earth, oh, I brought a laser pointer, even though this point is too this is better. Um, and looking at, say, some distant galaxy, there are clouds of stuff. Most of it's actually in our own galaxy, close to us. But there's stuff in the distant galaxy, and there's stuff in the intergalactic medium. There's clouds of this gas and dust that absorbs visible light. So uh, if you have long enough wavelength stuff, like this that's shown as red, it goes right through. But if you have short wavelength stuff, visible light, it gets blocked. And this dust here will warm up because it's, being, uh, it's uh, absorbed this and will re-emit that light at much longer wavelengths. And of course, even if there's no background source, these clouds are not at absolute zero, so they naturally emit. And it turns out the place they emit is the far infrared. The wavelengths they get through almost everywhere, if there's an energetic process behind it, is, is in the far infrared and some millimeter. You can only see pictures like this if there's nothing blocking your view. And there are lots of those things. There's lots of nice pictures of galaxies. The Hubble Space also has taken lots. But that's you know, a finished product. Here's a galaxy that's done. If that galaxy was just forming, all the stuff that's happening, all the action is actually inside dense clouds of stuff where the, where the dust there is blocking our view. So uh, when you're looking at a submillimeter, you really see a different picture. This is a standard picture of a fairly interesting galaxy not too far away from us. That's the standard picture you get with visual light. If I was to throw on, I'll throw on two wavelengths, X-ray and submillimeter, or far infrared, uh, there's what you can see. It's a quite a different picture between these two. So the, uh, the brownish stuff here is the far infrared submillimeter. Far infrared and submillimeter are almost the same thing. I'll talk a little more about exactly what I mean by those. And then the blue stuff there is, is x-rays. And uh, you can see that there's quite a different picture between these two. There's a lot of extra stuff you're missing. And even more interesting is this stuff in the middle, which is dust that's blocking our view. There's two different types of dust. There's the stuff up here that's just blocking our view, and there's the stuff down here that's actually emitting in the far infrared. So this is actually hot dust and cool dust. And uh, so there's lots of extra information. If you don't study these things in the far infrared, then you, you miss a lot. Here's a really bright nearby galaxy. That's a, what's called an ultraluminous infrared galaxy. And here's the visible light down here. This is the starlight. This is the near infrared, the mid infrared. This is the far infrared or submillimeter. 1,000 microns is one millimeter. So this is called the submillimeter. Usually submillimeter is down to about 100 microns, maybe 200 microns, and through here is called the far infrared. The, the nomenclature is a little bit uh, not exact. You know, we haven't really formally defined it. But anything beyond about, say, 40 microns out to uh, 1,000 uh, microns or a millimeter is the far infrared slash submillimeter. Here's a bunch of more normal galaxies. Not all of them. Some of them are kind of unusual galaxies. Again, here's the, this is just a little part of the wavelength range from 50 to 200. So this is just the far infrared. 
shown on here. So a whole bunch of galaxies, some of them again are peaking near 100 microns, some are a little bit short of 100 microns. There's, these galaxies are not the same, they're all kind of different, you can see just the general shape is different. But then there's also these extra things, these features that come, instead of coming from the dust, which is what all the continuum emission here is just because it's hot dust in these clouds, there's also actually 99% of the mass is in gas, and the gas emits like this. And all of this is in this far infrared wave band. If you look nearby, star forming areas very, very close to us, this is just a pictorial sort of representation, but it's, it's quite accurate, is that very, very young objects, things that are about to form stars, look something like this. Uh, if you look at this, this is again peaking at around 100 microns, which is the far infrared. When you start to get a, a star form, this is a very young stellar object starting to form, you start to get some stuff in the mid infrared, sorry, the, into the near infrared, uh, but it's still brightest at 100 microns. By the time you have a real star there, it's not yet a normal star like the sun, it's now peaking down in the near infrared, and far infrared is now fading away. There's a disk that's forming planets. If you want to see planets, this is where it's bright. And then by the time you get to a regular star like the sun, it's brightest actually just short of, of one micron. It's, it's, it's a visible light, and far infrared's gone. So all of these stages where you're forming a star, forming a disk that's forming planets, are, are brightest in the far infrared. But here's the problem. There's the far infrared, and this is the uh, opacity of the Earth's atmosphere. So in visible light, right here, the atmosphere is, is, has zero <coughs> opacity. That means you can see through it. And through most of the radio band, the atmosphere is again completely transparent. But in the far infrared, right through here, you can't see through the Earth's atmosphere. If you go just beyond here, actually even the edge of this band, just short of a, a millimeter, one, uh, say 800 microns. If you go high enough, on top of a mountain, you could actually get some data. Not very good. Uh, if you go down to here in the near, in the, uh, near infrared, a few microns, there are some places where, from the ground, you can do some work. But uh, you know, if you have anything that's in here, especially all the spectral lines which are only found there, uh, you need to go into space. And so that's what we've done. If you go to high altitude, as I said, 4,000 meters, for example, this is the one slide where the wavelength scale is backwards. It goes from a third of a millimeter to one millimeter, so this is really the sub-millimeter. This is one of the highest sites where we currently have telescopes. And instead of opacity, this is transmission. So at long wavelengths, this, this, the tra this radiation trans is transmitted right through the atmosphere, so you can see. But at shorter wavelengths, say this is uh, 350 microns, this is 450 microns, and at the very, very best conditions, which is here, only about half the radiation gets through. And uh, that's only good about 10% you know, of the time. So if you really want to do science, if you want to look at something right here, for example, right here, the reason there's a big gap here is because actually water in your atmosphere is blocking it. If you want to study water in interstellar space, the, the ground state rotational transition of water is at 557 gigahertz, which is right here. And you can't study water in space. And of course, water is you know, the fundamental molecule of life. If you want to study water in the universe, where is there life in the universe? How does water get onto planets? You can't do it from the ground because even a tiny bit of water completely blocks your view. So there's a site at 4,000 meters. That's up top of Monte Cay. You can see the snows there. I was there a few months ago. And one of my good buddies is there right now. And this is our telescope. This is the, partly owned by Canada. Actually, this is Canada France and Wyatt Telescope. This is the biggest telescope on the mountain, but it's too far.